After two and a half decades of war, in 1815, Europe's great powers met at Vienna to undo Napoleon Bonaparte's French Empire. There, among other things, they agreed to unite the Low Countries, the modern Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. But within a generation, the United Kingdom of the Netherlands would split. The Belgian Revolution birthed a new state in the South, but Belgium had never really been a nation before, so why did Belgians feel a need to break away? Well, at first they didn't. The people of what was once the Austrian Netherlands, Belgium, and those in the north of the new United Kingdom, lands of the old Dutch Republic, had been united in 1815 on equal terms. So, what was it that pushed Belgium to revolt, and why did no one powerful stop them from disrupting the continental order set at Vienna? What broke the United Netherlands? Well, before the French Revolution, today's Belgium didn't exist. In its place were a scattering of old noble estates, duchies and counties that together formed the Austrian Netherlands. To its north was the Dutch Republic, ruled by the House of Orange Nassau, and to its south was France. The latter took it from Austria in the War of the First Coalition. With the fall of Napoleon, the House of Orange was restored and also given the land to itself, which Austria had renounced. William I of Orange became King of the United Netherlands and separately Grand Duke of Luxembourg. At the time, his southern subjects didn't have a distinct Belgian nationality. The Dutch, though, would inadvertently give them one. Unfortunately for William I, the United Netherlands was never really all that unified. William's claim to the South was approved of by the great powers, particularly Britain, to create a strong buffer state near a still untrustworthy France. Not because any sense of national identity really linked Belgium to Holland. Accordingly, the New Kingdom, which for administrative purposes was divided into provinces, was more prominently split down the middle by the old border. In the north, essentially the modern Netherlands, people spoke Dutch and were mostly Calvinist Protestants, while in the south there were two main groups, the French-speaking Walloons of Wallonia and the Dutch-speaking Flemings of Flanders. Both were overwhelmingly Catholic, and both were riled by restrictions put on their church by the Protestant King William. The southern aristocracy expected to be left to run things without much intervention as they had for centuries, and they clashed with Orangist centralization policies. In general, the North wished to assimilate the South. Officially, the United Netherlands recognized separation of church and state, but the King favored and promoted Protestantism. William also set about Dutchifying the South, discouraging the use of French, which in addition to being spoken by the Walloons, was the usual language of the upper class in otherwise Flemish areas. In theory, though, North and South were equals. For example, each was guaranteed 50% of the seats in the state's general legislature. But in practice, William I appointed governments dominated by Northern Protestant Dutch. The state's general had very little power. For the Dutch, in general, that was acceptable. Orangist despotism was returned to normalcy after the period of revolution. For the Southerners, though, it was not. The Belgian economy was based on industrial production, and that spawned a rapidly growing liberal middle class. Belgians who had been exposed, through 20 years of direct French rule, to notions of legality and individual liberty. A seemingly unnatural coalition began to form, a union of liberals and Catholics, of the middle class, large landowners, and the clergy. That said, no great conspiracy was ever afoot to plan Belgian independence. Up until 1830, the main goal of Belgian politics was concessions within the United Netherlands. The spark of revolution would come from the Belgian masses, and not too surprisingly, was inspired by events in France. The July Revolution toppled France's autocratic House of Bourbon in 1830. By August, inspired French-speaking Walloonians were on the streets of Brussels, and they were angry. The southern economy had hit a rut, and the first Belgian revolutionaries were much more concerned about unemployment and slashed wages than they were about anyone's ideals. The response from William I, and in Dutch public opinion though, was that the South was being openly treacherous. 
For 15 years, the Dutch had feared that the Catholic liberal political union in the South was a ruse to buy time for a Belgian war of liberation, and the King's sons were sent with an army to restore order in the southern provinces. Meanwhile, in Brussels, a provisional government was declared by the liberals. They ended the riots by forming a civil guard. Now, the anger of the masses was directed towards the Dutch, which wasn't hard because of the army marching towards them. William and the North had no intention of appeasing the Southerners through reform. Belgium was in outright revolt, and in respectable states like the Netherlands, revolts are to be crushed. On September 23rd, the Prince's army attacked Brussels, and they successfully turned secession from an extremist view to a mainstream one. Brutal street fighting saw the royal army pushed out, and the emboldened provisional government at last began to assert that they were independent from the Dutch king. Plans were drawn up to elect a body to write a constitution, and fundamental freedoms of education, of the press, of the church, and of association were declared rights of the Belgian nation for the first time. The Dutch army fell back behind the borders of the old Dutch Republic, and began to disintegrate as thousands of southern soldiers deserted. None of which went unnoticed abroad. The southern rebels controlled all of this territory at the start of 1831, but the revolution's success in the long run was dependent on the goodwill of the great powers. They could definitely have crushed the Belgians, but no one wanted to commit to that and potentially start a Europe-wide conflict. At the London Conference in late 1830, at first they planned to partition Belgium and Luxembourg, which had thrown in its lot with the revolution. That was a French idea, and it went nowhere. Then they considered accepting its sovereignty, but still with a member of the House of Orange on the throne. But the Belgians moved faster when they formally proclaimed their own independence in November 1830. Belgium then tried to choose a son of Louis-Philippe, the new liberal French monarch, as their king. That was unacceptable, as France was still scary. Eventually, the British-backed candidate, Leopold of saxe coburg was elected and installed as the first king of the Belgians. The London Conference recognized his kingdom's independence on the condition that Belgium be a perpetually neutral state. The Dutch refused to accept that and invaded, only to find that the powers weren't bluffing and then be repelled by French troops. Even still, the Netherlands was offered concessions, half of Limburg province and a reduced Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. Insulted, obstinate, and naively hopeful that the South would come back of its own accord, the Dutch refused those terms. It took until 1839 for them to accept reality, relent, and recognize the independence of Belgium. The 1830s saw Europe's powers meddle in another state, born from another revolution. To find out how modern Greece grew, check out the video on the Megalia Dare to the left. You should enjoy it if you like this one, and as always, thanks for watching.